Good morning, beloved. Beloved here in the church, community church of Vero Beach in this sanctuary, beloved in Christ to our worshiping in community hall this morning at C2. God bless you. And those of you who are worshiping around this country and around the world, God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. The Bible has a great deal to say about forgiveness, our topic for this morning. Paul wrote to at least two of the communities, first to the community uh, at Ephesus, saying, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And to the community at Colossae, he wrote, bearing with one another, if any has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And following today's text, with which Reverend Dave just read, Matthew 18, the next two verses, Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? as many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Please pray with me that God will illumine the path to forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing, that we will all be made well and live. Let us pray. Holy One, please forgive us when we allow anger and bitterness to fill our heart because we refuse to forgive someone who has hurt us or we refuse to acknowledge our part in causing harm to someone else. Teach us how to let go of our resentment and choose step by step to forgive one day at a time as you have forgiven us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts on these texts, O Lord, be faithful to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh, it is so delicious to get all uppity about how right we are and how wrong somebody else is. Have you ever done that? Kind of feels really good, doesn't it? We humans sometimes get so angry, it's just kind of juicy to hate somebody or something that caused harm to us, to those we love or to the world. How dare they? When we get angry, we humans have a tendency to complain about the offender to anyone we think will give us a little bit of sympathy. We talk smack about them by telling our friends about who they are and how we were wronged instead of doing the one thing that can make it okay by taking it to the person who hurt us. In today's lesson from Matthew, Jesus says, zip it. <laughs> right here in Matthew 18, zip it in public. So this morning we'll reflect on the Jesus way to reconcile with one another when sin separates us. Let me tell you a story that was told to me by a friend of mine, the late Diana Garland. This story tells how the Irish expression chancing one's arm began. You may have heard of it. On display in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland, hangs an ancient door with a rough hewn rectangular opening hacked right in the center. This remarkable story of the door of reconciliation relates the Irish expression of chancing one's arm towards the forgiveness we all seek. You see, in 1492, two prominent Irish families, the Ormonds and the Kildares, were in the midst of a bitter feud. Besieged by Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare, Sir James Butler, Earl of Ormond, and his followers took refuge in the chapter house of St. Patrick's Cathedral, bolting themselves in. As the siege wore on, the Earl of Kildare concluded the feuding was foolish. Here were two families worshiping the same God in the same church, living in the same country, trying to kill each other. So he called out to Sir James 
and as the inscription in St. Patrick's reads to today, undertook on his honor that he should receive no villainy, afraid of some further treachery, Armand did not respond. So Kildare seized his spear, cut a hole in the door, and thrust his hand through. It was grasped by another hand inside the church. The door was opened, and the two men embraced, thus ending this family feud. From Kildare's noble gesture came the expression, chancing one's arm. If you visit St. Patrick's Cathedral to this day, you will marvel at the hole in the door where Sir Kildare risked losing his arm to Sir Ormond by extending it to his enemy. Jesus, who so often speaks in parables and leads by example, to t today teaches very specific, practical, and necessary steps to chance one's arm for the sake of restoring relationships in community. Matthew directs these, Jesus' teachings towards a fragile, vulnerable collection of people trying to navigate a new kind of community amid hurt and uncertainty and grief following Jesus' death. The writer of Matthew didn't have a healthy community like our own in mind, a church with a clearly defined purpose, a defined and clear, clearly articulated mission, and bylaws to guide our mutual concerns. Nevertheless, Jesus knew that whenever two or more gather in his name, a fight is going to break out sooner or later over something as important as the color of the tinfoil on the Easter lilies. So I think Matthew here practiced a little psychological technique called primary prevention. I think that's also used in medic medicine. He knew that even when all our relationships are thrumming along in harmony, we need in our toolkit spiritual tools for that day when they are not. We remember Matthew for his directness. The, we would much prefer to read Luke or John. Luke, the physician, those stories of healing are tender to our heart. John is the poet. It reads like a play, not Matthew. Matthew is not the one you turn to when you have skinned your knee. <laughs> always matter of fact, always direct. He assumes that the community is going to experience pain, conflict, and struggle and disagreement as they figure out what it means to be Christ followers amid conflict, amid Roman or national or international occupation, and in the midst of competing allegiances. In a time when so many of our churches are asking, can't we all just get along? Matthew says, no, no. But we have a plan for that. This process of forgiveness intends to reconcile parties, not just for their own personal sake, but for the sake of the community that can never be healthy as long as such a breach stands. There's much to be said about how to forgive ourselves or how to forgive someone with whom a conversation would not be safe or possible. And while Jesus addresses both this kind of very personal as well as great systemic sins elsewhere, here in this passage, Matthew recounts Jesus' teaching on what to do when there's a breach in our local community. So just for today, consider with me that person in your circle of care with whom you might chance your arm. Think about someone in this or another faith community who hurt you or wounded you in such a way that the pain continues to fester like a splinter under your skin. This person may be in your neighborhood community or your social group or within your family or extended family. Unlike the human body that heals itself over time, an unhealed breach in relationship 
can last a lifetime. According to Matthew, Jesus keeps it simple. Step one, when someone sins against you, that is when someone acts in a way that causes you hurt or harm, betrays you or takes advantage of you, then go alone to that person. Tell them what happened and how it affected you. If that person receives you, if that person hears you, apologizes to you, then forgive them. You have regained that relationship. Jesus urges his disciples to have honest conversation in private with the offending party. No passive aggressive behavior, no triangulation, just forthright conversation. We know that it is so much easier to complain to others about the one who has offended us than to talk directly to that offending person. But Jesus leaves no room for such self-absorbed grudge nursing. Restoring a broken relationship begins in private between two parties concerned. Step two. When you do go in private to someone who hurt you and you are not received or you are not heard, then Jesus advises you to take one or two other people you trust with you. Not so that they're on your side and tell you you've got a right to be upset, so that you, but so that you have witnesses to your truth and also to their response. If that person then receives you, hears you, apologizes to you, and you forgive them, and you will forgive them, then you have regained that relationship. Step three, if that person still refuses to listen, then tell it to the church, to your community. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the community, to the wisdom of the gathered leaders, to the community, then treat that offending party as if they were a Gentile and a tax collector. It is tax season after all. Great example, Matthew, as as if it weren't enough that this offender were a Gentile, also a tax collector. We get that. Now at this point, it may seem like Matthew says you can give up on the schmuck, but not so fast. Jesus makes it clear that no one is beyond the reach of God's mercy. Not even the ones we love to hate. It's true though. There may be times when it becomes necessary to exclude someone for the well-being of the community. Yet God's story in their lives continues. As followers of the way of Jesus, we always seek the lost sheep. We always set a place at the welcome table for them in the event that they one day return. The text from Matthew lays out a compassionate process that avoids shaming and embarrassment. No cancel culture, no unfriending, ultimately seeks restoration, not further division. By moving from a private conversation to a small group conversation to finally an intervention before the church or the community, the offender is given multiple opportunities to recognize what has been broken, to admit their wrongdoing, and to be thus restored to community. Years ago, I served a church where a man I'll call Jim, he was a man who couldn't stand me and sat every Sunday on the back row with his arms crossed like this. He was just waiting for me to mess up. He made a habit of criticizing everything I did with anybody who would hear him, although he remained unfailingly polite to me. At first, I was hurt by the comments that I heard second, third, and fourth hand, and I worked really hard to win him over. I visited him and his wife at home. I supported him when a family member became ill, and I met with him in my office whenever he wanted to question whether or not I was sufficiently saved and born again to have earned the right to teach and preach in church. 
When my personal attempts at reconciliation failed, I took a member of the personnel committee with me to see what we could do to alleviate his concerns. Eventually, members of the church confronted Jim for acting like a bully, expressed their support of my leadership, and asked him to either reconcile with me and the church or find another community better matched to his theology. They did it very lovingly, but they did it. It was brave. When Jim left the church, he continued to talk smack about me in the wider community, once calling me the Antichrist. That gives me a whole lot of power I don't have. <laughs> he became to our faith community as a Gentile and a tax collector, and many said, good riddance. Yet I continued to pray for him with a mixture of dismay and, to be honest, relief that he'd found another church. Then God changed Jim's heart. From the distance of another church, he listened to one of my sermons online as if for the first time and then watched how the church served one of his friends who suffered from a disabling illness. After calling for an appointment, he came in to see me and he apologized. Pastor, he said, God convicted my heart. I was wrong. Please forgive me. This man chanced his arm. No one would have blamed me if I had thanked him for coming, wished him well at his new church, and shown him the door. But this story isn't about the response of the community who did, in fact, welcome him home. God's mercy and grace gave Jim the courage to make things right. It always takes courage to tell someone the truth with love, someone who has hurt you, someone whom you have hurt, to risk rejection and further pain, to become vulnerable before the one by, who by rights could return hurt with further harm. So how do we forgive from the heart? It's so hard. It helps to remember that to forgive is not to deny the pain or wrongness of an act. It is not to excuse that which is unjust or hurtful, nor is it to tolerate further abuse. Yet in confronting one another and receiving one another, we come face to face with our own sin and brokenness and realize that both parties utterly depend on the grace of God. When someone wrongs us, it can be so painful. A colleague at work betrays us. A friend talks about us behind our back. A business partner cheats us. A relative abuses us. These betrayals hurt, make no mistake. What then do we do? The human instinct is to retaliate, get even. Netflix nourishes us and flourishes by entertaining us with movies and television series that exact justice on our terms. We love it when whomever we think is the bad guy gets it in the end. But God's way is very different from that. God's way is to overcome evil with good. Instead of retaliating, Jesus teaches us to forgive and to do good towards that person. Jesus asks us to forgive the person who wronged us, to set them and set us free. Most of us find this really difficult. It's the hardest work of love to forgive, the hardest work but the refusal to forgive destroys us. Theologian Frederick Buechner writes, of all the deadly sins, resentment appears to be the most fun. To lick our wounds and savor the pain you will give back is in many ways a feast fit for a king. But then it turns out that what you are eating at the banquet of bitterness is your own heart. The skeleton at the feast is you. You start out holding a grudge, but at the end, the grudge holds you. When you forgive someone 
who has deeply hurt you, you let go of resentment and the urge to seek revenge no matter how deserving of these things the wrongdoer may be. You give the great gifts of acceptance, generosity, and love. Though the wrongdoer does not deserve these gifts, you don't let that stand in your way. You forgive, not out of pity, not out of grim obligation or duty. I have to because I'm a Christian. Rather, you forgive because as one forgiven, you choose mercy over revenge. You reject bitterness and choose life. Maybe the singing group ABBA got it right all along. If you change your mind, I'm the first in line. Take a chance on me. Take a chance on me. Take a chance. Amen. Oh, my goodness. It is hard to believe it has been 10 years since I was asked to stand up and just share with you what I, why I am Community Church during this very important time of year, stewardship. In 2013, I'd only been a member of Community Church for two years. I was drawn here to help find a home for my hands, my heart, and my soul. After visiting four or five other churches in the community, I knew I had found my new home after just one service and one after church courtyard visit. I found the missions table in the courtyard and started asking about what opportunities they had for volunteering in the community. After a 20 minute lesson from Scott Turner, AKA the big guy, I was hooked. Where do I sign, I asked. Two years later, my prayers were answered when I was asked to be on the missions board, which in my mind is the most important board in our church. Now I'm sure I'm gonna get some flack from that statement, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> Being on the missions board allowed me to see firsthand not only the needs that Indian River Cl County has in our little slice of paradise, as we like to say in the real estate business, but also the important role that Community Church has played and continues to play in helping those needs. Do you know there are charitable organizations in our community that got their start right here from Community Church? Gifford Youth Achievement Center, the Food Pantry, Habitat for Humanity, Samaritan Center, and Crossover Missions all are here today helping our community because we saw the need and acted on it. I am sure I've missed some, but you get my gist. Did they do it alone? No. Now this is the part that I really love. They brought together other churches, synagogues, parishes to help meet those needs. Community Church recognized that the larger the group they had working on these common goals within our community, the faster they could get started meeting their needs collectively. Now, another recent fact that I've just learned about Community Church in my years of serving here is that we are the largest ecumenical contributor to nonprofit agencies in the county in both dollars and volunteers. Wow, think about that. Now that speaks volumes to me. A question I had early on after seeing all the great work they provide throughout the county is, where do they get their dollars to help these agencies and individuals? The answer to that is community church tithes, and yes, I do like that word for this instance, 11% of the total pledges they receive from our congregation to mission work. That doesn't mean that we stop there. I would be remiss in not sharing with you our Naomi House story. In October of 2016, our missions board was made aware of a critical need in our county for a homeless women's shelter. There are shelters for men and families with children, but nothing for single women. This need did not arise from the homeless camps that we all know about, but from the need of a 52-year-old woman who had not worked for over 12 years because she was a full-time caregiver to her aging parents. 
she suddenly found herself on the street and living in her car. With the passing of her mother, there was no longer the disability and social security income they had been receiving to meet their living needs. What she needed was a safe place she could go to while she figured out her newfound dilemma. Our missions board went into overdrive and said, we've got to do something here. We approached Reverend Bob, who supported us 100%, but because of the time of year, he could not commit the church to any significant outlay of funds. We told him, once again, we got this. This isn't community church's sole responsibility, but our community's responsibility. We then identified two duplexes we, and went on the market last the year before, and from there we began making it a reality. The funds for the purchase, the needed improvements, furnishings, and one year of operating cost were all raised in record time by December 31st. That was two and a half months. Reverend Bob was shaking his head for sure. Again, by bringing other churches, individuals, and organizations into this project, we accomplished our goal. Today, the Naomi House is still in operation and filling those needs for short-term temporary housing for women. Yes, community church cares. So what is your takeaway today? Be proud to say you belong to community church. And when you give to community, it isn't just about our beautiful sanctuary, the unparalleled music program, a sense of fellowship that makes us all feel at home. You are also helping hundreds of local people on a weekly basis without even knowing it. For that, we all must be proud. Now, I just have one more plug I need to make before they get the hook, where is it, um, and get me off of here. Please consider joining us on one of our Community Cares Caravan Tours. You will then have the opportunity, as I did, to see just what is behind the names of those 32-plus organizations that we help to support. Our next one is March 16th, and we'll be touring Ark of Indian River County, Senior Resource Center, and Crossover Missions. You will love it, so bring your friends. My name is Beth Livers, and I am Community Church.